It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. I'll be your host this morning. I'm going to cover a couple of different issues today. You know, I, I talked yesterday about the idea of covering Common Core, but I think in light of where we are on this issue of Syria, we're going to address that today. And I think we're going to address it because uh, we are looking here at a row that I believe America needs to fully understand. Um, as it stands this morning, uh, the Obama administration has come out and made a number of statements not the least of which is that they are basically giving away the attack plan to anyone and everyone. As in fact, there's an article out there this morning with a headline of Why Pursue Snowden When Obama Is Giving Away the Plan of Attack to Everyone Who Wants to Listen. And so uh, I think what we want to uh, discuss is the issues surrounding uh, this, this uh, folly in Syria. And uh, so we're going to address that first and foremost in our uh, first and second segment. In our third segment, we're going to talk about the revelations of Fort Hood and how um, the FBI completely dropped the ball in that entire investigation with uh, significant levels of of advanced information and then hid that fact from the American public by refusing to release the email path and the threads of emails that they had uh, between Al-Aki and and the Fort Hood shooter. And so uh, this was clearly a preventable tragedy and one that uh, uh, really needs to be exposed to America. Our fourth and final segment this morning will deal with the nudge policy of uh, Cass Sunstein and how this administration is seeking to socially engineer our nation. And, um, uh, you know, these are important issues that uh, really need uh, an opportunity for the public to be made aware of. And that, of course, is the goal of America's Voice Now, right? Our program really is designed to expose the Ministry of Propaganda and tell you the truth where they refuse to do so. So let's tag up first on this Syria thing, because I got to tell you, you know, they're, they're claiming that they have intercepted calls that prove the Syrian army used this nerve gas. And um, yeah, l- last Wednesday, uh, they got some they got uh, they tracked some calls. And um, in the hours after a horrific chemical attack, an official at the Syrian Ministry of Defense exchanged panicked telephone calls with a leader of chemical of a chemical weapon unit in Syria, demanding answers for a nerve agent strike that killed more than a thousand people. Those conversations were overheard by U- U.S. intelligence services Uh and so that's what they're classifying this, uh, the, these um, uh, intercepted calls based on. Now, the, the, the question here, of course, is that while that may well be the case, and they may have an intercept that they can point to, that doesn't answer the questions about who was culpable uh, and who was responsible for the chemical massacre. So the question is, when you get a, when you hear an overhear a panicked call, and of course, we'll, we'll probably not be privy to that call, um, and, and even if we are, we'll be privy to a chopped up and modified, propagandized version of that call. But essentially, um, what that tells us is that, yes, there was a call made, and it was from a, a, uh, an official in the Syrian Ministry of Defense. And... He was demanding answers from a chemical weapons unit leader. And so the question is, was the government of Syria responsible for this? Was it a rogue officer? Was it the rebels themselves? We don't really know. And if, if, if it was by Syria, was the strike ordered or directed by senior members of their administration, or whatever you want to call it, the regime, whatever, and... 
The issue is that we're unclear at this point on a lot of things, not the least of which is we don't really know who's ultimately responsible here. We don't know whether it was the rebels themselves in an attempt to try to uh, create or throw out a false flag. We don't know whether it was the Syrian government. We don't know whether it was a Syrian uh, officer of of a unit. Nor do we know whether this was a false flag that was assisted by American uh, forces being um, or or assisting uh, the rebels in doing something that would enable us to then move forward in this fashion. And, you know, I I don't know. um, You know, everybody out there doesn't want to hear the conspiracy theory of things. But I got to tell you that it, it pays for us to look beyond the obvious because you know, it, it's not hard for them to restack the facts in a manner in which it, it expresses that we are um, th- that that one event or one uh, explanation of an event occurred. And, and, I, and we have to be careful that I mean, what we do know and what we have seen is that this administration is capable uh, of some very, very surreptitious and devious uh, and, and, quite frankly, scurrilous methods. And we've seen them not only used internationally, but domestically as well. And so I don't want to overlook that. I don't want to point to it and say it's definitively that. But at the same point in time, we'd be negligent and malfeasant in our, ex- in our, uh, in our search for the truth. Let's put it that way. So the real question here, and, and, and by the way, there, there was a U.S. intelligence agent who recently, uh, the other day, told The Cable, which is, uh, The Cable, by the way, is the foreign policy magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations. So what you read from The Cable always has to come with a major dose of salt because uh, that is the Council on Foreign Relations, which for all intents and purposes is one of the you know, supreme leaders, if you will, of the globalist movement, right? But here's what this particular senior U.S. official said. And, of course, he's, he's unnamed because he didn't have permission to speak. And he didn't have permission definitely to speak this way. Here's his quote. It's unclear where control lies. Is there just some sort of general blessing to use these things? Or are there explicit orders for each attack? In other words, the question was, was you know was this something that was done as a you know as a a generally ordered uh from from on high or was this something you know lower down where somebody just took the uh took the initiative themselves and then he goes on to say we don't know exactly why it happened we just know it was pretty blanking stupid and that statement in and of itself tells me that there is a lot of question out there as to the real culpability of one group or the other. And what we do know is that the the standard for determining a true chemical weapons attack is to obtain uh, empirical proof. And you do that by obtaining soil samples. You do that by obtaining blood samples from the victims because if they've breathed this gas in, you've got you've got examples of it. Uh, you do that by by uh, you know testing the soil and dust that's that's layered where you can find evidence that there was a chemical weapon and what that chemical weapon actually was composed or comprised of, um, and, and and other environmental type samples, right? And so we don't have those, and yet here we are rushing to go to war and to do this however brief and limited they may be claiming these strikes are going to be, rushing off to engage America in another folly. <clears throat> and I, I really truly believe that what we are doing right now is uh, more for saving face for the president than it is for actually accomplishing anything in the line of trying to uh, mitigate what's, what's gone on and happened in, in Syria and future use of these chemical weapons. First of all, they're coming out and they're telling Syria that they're going to start striking on Thursday, which right off the bat, you never tell the enemy that you're going to strike. That's called telegraphing the punch. And I find that to be not only a useless exercise, but also foolhardy. You know, there was an old adage that used to be used back in World War II that loose lips sink ships. 
And this is an administrative loose lip that is literally telling Syria what they're going to do. And then they're also saying that it's going to involve three days worth of strikes and that the uh, the the overall impact of these strikes is not going to go after um, Assad himself. Well, OK, so let's just take that information that we just garnered. And this is from senior U.S. officials. And they're talking to ABC News. So this isn't like, you know, this isn't some conspiracy minded stuff. This is. NBC, which is definitely the mouthpiece of this administration, uh, quoting senior U.S. officials. What that tells us is that, one, if we know when the attack is going to begin, how long it's going to last, and that Assad is not theoretically in danger himself, that we're saying to him, listen, relax, we've got to do this in order for to, to cover public comment issues. We've got to deal with this in, in the sense that we can't allow... Uh, me as an administrative leader of this nation to lose face. And so, you know, we're not going after you. We're going to take out some token targets. Not to worry. After about uh, by Tuesday of next week, you can resume. (laughs) I mean, really? Is that not what we're telling him? I mean, ask yourself that question. The New York Times quotes a Pentagon official who says, quote, the initial target list has less than 50 sites, including air bases where Syria's Russian-made attack helicopters are deployed. And and then the Times goes on to add, like several other military officials contracted or contacted for this report, the official agreed to discuss planning options only on conditions of anonymity. Okay. Here's where the whole thing gets muddled. If they're actually telling the enemy what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and when they're going to do it and where they're going to do it and that he has nothing to worry about, what's actually the point of doing it? I mean, is he doing this so that the world's newspapers and media organizations can go out and trumpet the fact that, you know, when they crossed the red line, Obama, the fearless, stepped up to the plate and drew his sword? Or are they doing this so that they can, so that, you know, Assad has some measure of, early initiative knowledge so that he can get get out of Dodge and hide himself in some rat hole somewhere and, you know, basically not not be damaged or injured personally and with along with the senior staff so that, you know, by Wednesday of next week, they can resume. I mean, and if the whole point is to allow him to resume, then what's the whole point? I mean, if you're going to go in there, you don't start a war and prosecute a war in, in the sense that, we're looking to, um, you know, basically wound him. You don't start a war with the idea that you're going to wound. You start an idea with the with the or a war with the idea that you're going to take out the enemy and you're going to end the 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 atrocity. And what we're looking at now is, you know, essentially what we did in, in Kosovo, right? And, and back in, and in, in, uh, in, in um, well, we did it in Iraq, we did it in Afghanistan, we did it in Pakistan, we've done it in Yemen, we've done it in Somalia, we've done it in Vietnam. I mean, you know, this is coercive diplomacy. And what that, what that phrase means is that what we're going to do is we're going to, con- we're, we're going to be coercive about forcing you to, Follow the rules that we as the general group have laid out for you. And the general group is, you know, in this case, the U.S., England, France, and uh, anybody else that they can gather under their wing in NATO. They've essentially agreed that they're not going to seek further uh, coalition members from the United Nations. Russia has come out and said, uh, without any without any uh, bifurcation on the subject, if you go there, you are opening the door you don't want to open. China has come out and said the same thing. The Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, which is essentially the current Soviet Union, currently called Russia, has made it very clear. They are backing Assad. And <clears throat> those weapons and the, and, the, and the airplanes and the military material that we're about to take out is Russian mili- military material. W- didn't we just do this in Afghanistan, we funded the Mujahideen, and 
the Russians were prosecuting a war against Afghanistan. They lost after 20 years, with our help in some cases. In the other area, the realistic issue is that, and, 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 and fortunate, it's good for America because it shows us that there is absolutely almost no way possible that any government can subjugate an entire nation uh, of freedom fighters. And I'm not giving, you know, I'm, I'm, I, we're not even talking about political ideology, theology, or any of that other nonsense. What we are talking about is the fact that when you attack a people, irrespective of why you attack them, enemies today become allies against the interloper. And the interloper in this case is us. And so that's what happened in Afghanistan. That's what happened in Vietnam. That's what happened in Pakistan. That's what happened in Yemen. That's what happened in Mogadishu. That's what happened in Iraq. I mean, how many more examples do we need? It's what happened in Kosovo. The absurdity of this and the lessons unlearned by an administration with ample evidence to the contrary is just staggering. It really is. You know, we, we tried this, and, and I, I guess the best example of what we're doing now is the example of Kosovo. And the reason I say that is because, you know, we had in Kosovo the situation was very similar. There was a um, there was a a complete uh, genocidal event going on there, where you know they were attempting to take out the the Muslim um, minority. By the way, for those of you um, and for the record, Muslims, we went into Kosovo to save your butts. So let's remember that. But more importantly. We went in there with the idea that we were going to do this limited strike thing, right? This precision bombing campaign. And that that would, uh, that would coerce, you know, Milosevic uh, into resolving the crisis because he had to comply with NATO, you know, demands and all that kind of nonsense. Well, guess what? Their carefully uh, fabricated delusion of how uh, Milosevic was going to respond collapsed and failed. Milosevic did not respond the way that they anticipated he would. And in fact, it turned into this lengthy thing where we got involved and were, you know, we were over there for a long, long time causing the deaths of not only our own people, but, uh, you know, NATO forces, not to mention the, the deaths of, we don't even know how many uncalculated deaths were occurred in Bosnia and Kosovo and Herzegovina and all that. And so they, you know, they did these, they did these, these guided weapons, uh, you know, cruise missile type strikes, which is essentially what they're planning now. And they anticipated that, you know, Milosevic would collapse and they, but they were going to give him a way out, right? They were going to give him the ability to, um, you know, save face, but accept their terms of surrender. Well, the problem with that, folks, is that these think tank idiots, these knuckle draggers in these in these uh, think tanks who plug in to the computers the parameters under which they war game these scenarios, are operating from a, a, a position of delusion because they believe that everybody thinks with the same Western thought process that they think. And therein lies the problem, because not everyone in the world, and certainly no one in the Middle East, thinks the way we think. I mean, how much more proof do you need? You got Iraq, you got Afghanistan, you got Iran, you got you you got uh, Somalia, you got Yemen, you've got. I mean, the list goes on and on. You got Saudi Arabia, you got. uh, You know, the the list is endless. The Middle East thinks differently than we think. Their ideas of government, social interaction, theology, democracy, uh, dictatorship, government methodologies, policy, everything is different. So when you plug in parameters that are into a war gaming machine, and make no mistake about it, that's exactly what they're doing. When you plug those parameters in, you're plugging in mistakes 
and then you expect the end sum to come out not flawed. That's absurd. If you sit down with a calculator and you put the wrong numbers in, you're going to get the wrong result. And this is no different. This is exactly the mistake that we've made over and over and over and over again. From Korea to Vietnam, right on up to the present day in Afghanistan, and now here. The people that are putting this information together are operating under the delusion that they have the the mindset of, in this case, Assad, down pat. Let me tell you something. We have no idea what Assad thinks. And and, and I, I, I assure you of one thing. What will happen is that no matter how clean and sanitized they think this is going to be, it's going to end differently than they anticipated. And, and here's why. None of these people have military experience. None of them have military background. And none of them have been in the, in the forefront of prosecuting a new war. They may have adopted or, you know, the, the, the uh, Afghanistan and the Iraqi conflicts. But no one in this administration has the slightest concept of what it's like to go out and start a war from scratch. And there's where the, the, the fault is going to lie. Because, one, without, um, the, first of all, any military uh, strategist will tell you that no matter what your best laid plans are, when the bullets start to fly, all the plans go out the window. And in this case, when the cruise missiles begin to move, everything that they thought was going to happen is not. That's as simple as it gets. Secondarily, we're fighting on the wrong side. We are now supporting that organization, which we swear is our bitter enemy. In other words, we're actually supporting and fighting on al-Qaeda's side. In fact, there's an article out there in The Independent today from the... uh, This is a U.K. paper. Does Obama know he's fighting on al-Qaeda's side? All for one and one for all should be the battle cry if the West goes to war against Assad's Syrian regime. We're going to get cut off because we've got a hard break coming on. But I got to tell you, we're going to take we're going to look into this. And and I want to go over some of this story with you because I think it makes sense in in, in a lot of ways. And we're going to address and, and look at some other examples of the mistaken mathematics that went into the Kosovo scenario and how that backfired on us and how this again will backfire on us just like that. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. I'm your host. You can find us at americasvoicenow.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now. And then you can find this and every other video program that we do where we stream our, uh, uh, our radio program live over video. And you can forward that on to your friends. You can, you can find it at Uh, youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. We'll be right back in just a moment.